Well, hello everybody. Welcome to Sonic Talk, episode 797, recorded today on the 10th of April, as we rush headlong into what's looking like a very exciting super booth, just over a month away, and uh, the products are flying left, right and centre. Uh, we'll be talking about one of them a bit later on. Uh, this is the Music Technology Pro Podcast. We talk about all things to do with music technology. Fortunately for us, there's quite a lot of it about, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, but before I get you there, I just want to say thank you very much to our friends in the IRC see i mean that's not working today unfortunately but uh, all the chatters it's nice to see red walks and uh, james glue and synthologist and paul leblanc zen artist I want to say big thanks to wagyu as well for modding as he always does uh, i'm very mm. much appreciated in fact he was doing it last week from a from a train journey on the way to a gig. That's how dedicated he is. So, a round of applause for Wagyu there. Uh, <laughs> before we get going, yeah, before we get going, I'm just going to uh, uh, let you know about our Patreon because, uh, as ever, it's, uh, it's an important part of what we do. Hey, why not consider joining us on Patreon? For a mere three bucks a month, you get all of our monetized content at Posted Ad Free, as well as Sonic Talk pre-show, access to the Discord. Uh, if you want to take it up a level, still only six bucks a month. Uh, in fact, we've got an Astrolab Any Questions video. I've done a video here asking if you have any questions about that. That's open to all, but if you leave a comment there, the resulting video will be available to the upper tier. Uh, we posted the Bella Gliss review, ad free and early. Uh, I've also got uh, some MIDI SID loops from MIDI Error, which are stereo uh, samples as well as many other samples some of our review instruments are sampled there as well 360 videos the uh, sonic state live interviews in full plus 360 video for there if you join us by the end of the show your name will appear in lights at the end of the credits that's done automatically once again we do appreciate you considering supporting us it's really important that we keep ourselves independent and able to operate uh, ads are coming harder these days uh, and also if you have very much appreciated back to the show Almost pulled that one off. I must script it one day. But uh, anyway, so uh, let's get on to uh, introducing our guests. Mr. Gaz Williams there in Bristol, a uh, music technologist, label <laughs> owner, um, <laughs> and now, I suppose. Is it label owner or a label rack? How would you pronounce it? Uh, rack Record, Records. It? We, went, we, yeah. went to the, uh, we went to the launch the other day and all the other things that he does. How are you doing, Gaz? You well? Yeah, really good. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that was great. Um, so uh, thank you for mentioning that. Obviously, the Rack Records thing is now up and running, and we got our... Uh, I was amazed we got rackrecords.com. How about that? 2024, rackrecords.com. Um, so the, the fact that that was available for us. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, we are now official. Um, so just, uh, just to just to bring people up to date if they don't know about it basically steve davis and myself have set up this label and this label has got a it's got a manifesto we've got an absolute sort of you know um, a real definite sense of what we're trying to do which is essentially uh, well our tagline is spontaneous electronic conversations and we're really interested in um you know unscripted unprepared um you know just two people and two people or more i mean we're focusing on two people uh for the moment um and initially because i've quite a few people have been getting in touch asking me if we're interested in releasing their records and we're not i'm afraid because we're not looking at putting out produced music we are essentially trying to create events and jams and sessions from which we derive this material from and ah, i okay. think yeah and i think part of what that's about really is about um you know i mean it's kind of focused on eurorack um but it's not exclusively uh but it's more about this idea that um i suppose like jazz in a way you know or like you know pure improvisation mm, i was gonna say a bit like that yeah yeah um but we're also quite keen on releasing just pure untouched recordings as well and i think that's possibly what our you know the main focus of what we're doing is is all about which is uh you know uh i've, I've come to realize more and more may have may have said this before but when you record with a computer once the music goes into the computer the computer is then holding your music hostage you know your the computer the music's in there it's not in you anymore it's in there so you know you, you know it, and then the the realm of infinite adjustability and this idea yes. that you're always trying to prepare this perfect thing for the listener and you know we've been listening back to a lot of the jams that we've been having and sort of thinking well okay you know this bit's not so good but then it develops into this really wonderful thing 
and you remove the journey and just take what you perceive as the wonderful thing and it's not so good on its own it's just it's good there's no ebb and flow yeah Yeah. and so by leaving in the kind of uh the warts and all as steve says um i think it's it's a little bit about trying to almost have a more honest dialogue with the listener in a way and you're actually asking the listener quite a lot uh, you know you, you know you 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 have to ask you know you, you need the listener to be prepared to come on mm. this journey really and the rewards yeah. are definitely there but you know it's a different thing and it's much more long form um but i'm really yeah. enjoying that principle because it flies in the face of like 30 years of finickety perfectionist music production type. i had i had a similar epiphany when i was just stopped basically editing hi-hats and just doing my friday <laughs> fun jams and just anything i could only do stuff that i could play you know, that's it. And I mean, I'm, I'm not productive particularly, but so, but yeah, no, good for you, good guys. And I think it's a great experiment. And in, I was going to say it's quite similar to the sort of the night, that 1950s kind of jazz ethic where it would be in the room. I forget the name of the producer, wasn't it? It all went to tape and it was, it was often edited between takes, but nonetheless, you know, there was a, re- it was a similar sort yeah. of vibe, right? Well, we, you know, we're trying to be careful with our manifesto to sort of not get ourselves too stuck in a rut with it. With, oh, you know, um, but but basically, you know, the amount of computer interference, if you will, with it is just um, a little bit Minimum. of top and tailing, maybe just putting a few little fades in and out. Uh, and it's mostly, you know, it is just about selecting sections from sort of long jams and uh, yeah. but still going quite long form with it. Um, yeah, and sort of. Yeah. I've updated your lower third for rack records as well. There, just to, just to oh, let you know. Just I hope oh, I've got right. that right. So anyway, um, okay. Well, lovely to have you guys as ever. And we've also got look who it is, Steve Hillier, who's there in uh, in in his Brighton garret. I think it's Brighton anyway, with his uh, Helvetica. Is that Helvetica? Yeah, oh, it's Helvetica. A Helvetica poster. Uh, Helvetica poster. Yeah, uh, and also uh, there's a, a a sort of blanket that a friend of mine gave me because. Without it, the room just whites out, as you can kind of see over here. There's just too much sunlight down here. I was really interested in what Gaz was uh, saying there. There seems to be um, there's so much value in raw performance and improvisation. And it just reminded me that I was watching, uh, I think it was last night, the final episode of a comedy program called Curb Your Enthusiasm, which was oh, yeah. uh, written... Yeah, by Larry, Larry David. David, and a lot, especially in the early days, a lot of that program, a lot of that program was uh, improvised by the cast. There was like a an overarching point that had to be made within the scene, but the cast could basically play with it as their characters and improvise with it, and it created a um, a style of television program, style of comedy, which I, I think is fantastic. It's it's you can find it in other comedy places such as The Thick of It which was a, a British a political comedy uh, from the noughties and early 10s by Armando Iannucci. So, yeah, more mm. improvisation, everybody. Can I, yeah, can I, I think just that's cut, a pretty good show. Yeah. I just want to cut in. Smokey and the Bandit, the dialogue between Burt Reynolds and Sally Fields is all improvised. And if you watch that film again, it's really obvious and much better for it. <laughs> Uh, well, there we go. That's a retro reference there, uh, which brings me nicely to um, Richard. I don't know why that brings me to you. I guess because you had some compute, retro computer games in the back. Richard Nickel, Pittsburgh Modular, sure. back again. We can't sure. keep him away. He's uh, addicted, addicted to Sonic Talk. Lovely to see you, Richard. I hope you had a good week. I don't talk about synthesizers enough in my daily life. I, I need this to, <laughs> to, to fuel me for the week. It gets me moving. It's invigorating. Okay. I love it. I feel it's the like same way about trade a, shows. Synthesizer laxative. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about that. I mean, they're my words, of course, not yours. But, you know, I was just paraphrasing, I think. Uh, anyway, um, so we've got stuff. I mean, there's plenty of stuff to talk about this week. Uh, we have, in fact, a major new product. As we know, uh, Artoria were... Well, I- I'll play the first bit first. That's probably the easiest thing, and then we can just get on with it. And this is actually... This is not the review. This is an extra bit that I've added for our Patreons uh, who can ask questions, which I'll then do another video for them. But I thought I'd use it to plug the both. So I posted the review um, 
uh, yesterday, just about. I, I didn't quite get the deadline, but I wasn't a lot before it. I think Loop Pop was about half an hour early, which is... That he, he got his out before Frederick Bunn had announced it in the uh, in the live stream, which I, I, I imagine he's giving stern words, but fair play. So this is the new Astrolab, which is essentially uh, Artoria's... Well, they call it an avant-garde stage keyboard, and I hadn't realised this, but the bit in the middle is very similar to a, a Google Nest uh, a control, a thermostat, which I don't have. I have a hive. Mine's square. But I thought, oh, yeah, I, I wish I mentioned that in my review, but I didn't. Uh, but yes, this is essentially a DSP-powered keyboard which will play most of, not all, most of the V Collection 9. Uh, it, it, in terms of modelled pianos and modelled electromechanics, it will do uh, 48 voices of polyphony. In terms of the V Collection synths, such as pigments and CS80V and whatnot, it will do eight voices. But by Timbrel, very nice key bed. I think they had it specially designed or even make it themselves. I'm not totally sure about that. And quite a simple and stylish uh, interface which on reflection and having a bit, had a bit more time, because I didn't get all that much time with it, feels like it could have done with a bit more complexity, perhaps, for the sort of things that it's trying to do. So essentially, you can play all of the V Collection stuff, the presets in there, but you can't edit them. You've got macros, which are the things that are programmed at a patch level. If you want to edit and put your own patches in there, then you would need to own the, the requisite plugins, which you would then drop in. So that's that's kind of the thing. So in many ways, it's a great way for Altoria to sell even more V collections. And I'm sure there will be bundles and stuff. But I just thought this was interesting. Designed to be for stage. And the whole sort of thing was, it's a nightmare. You can't do this kind of thing. You can't take your stuff in the box and take it to the stage. Actually, thinking about it, uh, you can with Zencore, can't you? So it's not quite first, but maybe they've done it better. I don't know. What, what, what do you think, uh, Steve? I mean, I'm guessing as a songwriter, as a producer, you might want to be able to take some of those things out on the road if you were taken that way. I know you play as well. Is this sort of thing of yes. interest to you? What do you think? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I was... Um so I saw the launch of this uh, across the web yesterday, and I saw some of the reaction. There was a lot of people uh, seem to be a little unhappy about the inability to create your own sounds within the keyboard. Um, but it just kind of occurred to me that, that that's missing the point, in a sense. This is a performer's keyboard, and if you're going out on stage, you're not going to be most people in fact are not going to be sound designing in front of a, an audience and certainly certainly not if you've got like a five octave keyboard in front of you and you're playing what you would want in that case is access to the appropriate sounds for the gig and this seems to be a really nice way of bringing the the vitality and the complexity of synthesizers like pigments and the other models into a machine that you just you, you turn up put it on a stand plug it in plug it into the to the mixing board and off you go and i i think that's well it, it's one of the things that i've been wanting for a very long time um and i also really i like the, the fact that this from arturia is a instrument that's aimed at players you know what i mean it's mm. um it's it's not covered in knobs you're not distracted so much with the idea of um, having to create a new sound for whatever you do. You, you, you come to this unit to play it. And uh, I, I find that I find that kind of exciting. The one, there's just one thing that would um, slightly put me off at the moment. And I think that's got more to do with what I'm doing at this stage in my career than anything else. It's, it's, it's big and it seems to be quite heavy. Is that correct? Something like 10 kilograms? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say it's massively heavy, but there's a chunky old keyboard no. and keybed in it, which is a sort of semi-weighted. So I guess that adds to the whole kind of caboodle. Yeah. Well, this this may not necessarily be a problem, um, but I do know from my own experience of moving uh, even small bits of kit around uh, in Europe these days, it's it's a lot more complicated than it used to be for reasons that we can all uh, imagine. Mm, and, and also like big and heavy things become expensive to move. So just for now, I think what I'll be doing is using something like the Push 3 standalone unit with a controller keyboard. That gives me a lot of access to the to, to sounds and plugins that I really like, for example, the operator synth on, on Ableton. Mm. But with a larger budget and a big roadie, this would definitely be something that I would use. 
interesting interesting idea i mean i think you're right about the stage keyboard thing and i think we we are coming at it very much from synthesis and i was trying not to be too down on it for in the review about that i mean the fact that you have to own if you already own v collection and you want to go out live and you want to use v collection absolutely perfect fit if you don't then you might find yourself kind of going oh, i don't want to spend another whatever 600 quid on this i wondered whether or not they might release some version of it that gave you the ui of all the interface because the engines are in the synth and allowed you to control it and only save it in the synth but you couldn't then use those in your computer so there's a sort of there's a sort of halfway house but i suspect because analog lab is essentially a vst host that might be a, a nightmare of uh, of difficulty i don't know i mean the other thing is is you cannot control if you launch it you own the plugin you bring the plugin up you tweak the plugin parameters it is not actually tweaking the parameters in the synth it's it's tweaking the parameters in your local c uh computer version which you then have to save the preset and then you put the preset in the synth that's an extra step that makes it a little less fun i would say what do you think though guys i mean a player's instruments you've got to be all over it right yeah i mean it, it, it's really interesting isn't it i mean if you think about the whole um well, I mean, I was thinking about the origin, actually, when you were mentioning that Arturia did have a mm. stab at that, didn't they? Um, gosh, what's that, 15 years ago or something with the origin, which was, I think, probably, if they did it again with, you know, the, the horsepower that, that's maybe in this new machine is going to probably be a lot more powerful than what was in the other one. So I'd be interested to see, because that was a lovely design, the origin. I think they could, they could bring that back. Um, but I think this looks great. Uh, having done a lot of touring work uh, and knowing what is required of an instrument, and I think this is great. And I think that fairly clear, uncluttered um, presentation, it, it does make a lot of sense. And again, you know, I understand people who who are kind of going ah oh, but it isn't and or but uh, but 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 for 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 actual live yes this this makes a lot of sense and is very attractive uh, with it um i was curious when you said it can play some of the v collection but not all is that to do with what it comes loaded with if you've got if you've got the v collection yourself and you save the presets can you take everything over or is there well is there some I, I i i'm this is where i'm i have to confess i am not a hundred percent sure it says 27 okay. instruments and i think v collection has got 30 something so there are mm. i don't know which ones they are they haven't put that as a sort of hey folks <laughs> look what it doesn't do they haven't made a list for that and i didn't i don't have the collection so i can't re well i do now because i had to load it in there to to do certain mm -hmm. things but i i can't i can't tell you which ones but i know that there are some missing um okay. so it, and inevitably, it will be the ones that you use on your album that you want to play live. It, you know, just, just, just by the law of averages, I was, right? I was wondering if there was any like legal stuff going on or licensing stuff. I, I mean, I, I, are some of those Arturia V Collection licensed and some aren't? I'm, I'm not exactly sure how it works. Don't know. There were there's there's the Moog things, there's the ARP things, there's Korg things, there's uh, profit the things. Melaton. There's uh, Fairlight things. Mellotron, no. And I'm guessing the Mellotron, no, because mm. of the multiple layer, the sample, sample playback. Although internally, there's a, 20, there's a 22 gig of storage in there. You know, it's only okay, using it's seven or something. Pianos, haven't you, as well? Mm. No, okay. they're, they're yeah. modelled. The, the pianos are, are modelled. Yeah, uh, they're modelled pianos. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd be interested to know. I mean, so it's got this kind of playlist thing. This is something that we've been seeing Nord, I think, maybe were the first out to do it. But uh, this idea that you can create a playlist. So using this inspiration from, you know, like iTunes or Winamp or whatever to build a yeah. playlist of your set of of your sets so you you know like in the past having to rearrange all your presets in in so they'd be in sort of sequential order and stuff is a thankfully a bit of a thing of a past with this and then you create playlists for the different gigs or the different bands that you play play with which mm, that I makes sense i didn't i didn't really get into that i mean i i found there were because i was struggling quite a lot with the software concepts there's a few sort of cul-de-sacs and weird modal situations where uh, if you're doing this and you're in this then you need to go here first to do that and then do this to do that to, right. and it's so it's kind of quite and i didn't have it all that long so it was a little bit challenging at times 
you know, I mean, that's the kind of reality, you know, you're in the rehearsal room and you're working with a singer or, and, and they decide to sort of, you know, change the running order of a song or, or they say, oh, you know, yeah. um, can we play this song? Can we use like a Hammond organ or something in this song? And, and just being able to sort of adapt what you're doing really quickly, yeah. uh, you know, and if that playlist thing kind of works well and you can do that, then I can see this being absolutely brilliant in that role. Yes. Um, and I suspect yeah. also because there's a Wi-Fi point in it and you can connect like an iPad or an iPhone and I'm, I, I didn't have that. So, you know, I imagine making playlists and mod, mod, modifying them and changing levels and a few bits and pieces is going to be a lot easier on a on that because you're editing ultimately the patch in the Astrolab, oh. which gives you access to things that are easier to get to via GUI than via maybe the front panel. So I would say, uh, yeah. Is it multi-timbral? Can you create splits? Two. 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 Uh, 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 well, yeah, it's two, two, but there's only a pair of outputs, which, okay. you know, that would have been a, a real good one. If they could do two stereos, that would be really cool, but it's not. It's it does, a pair of outputs. It does have two mic inputs, though, on the back there, doesn't it? So it does function as an audio interface, too. Kind of. I do, again, I couldn't figure out how that worked because there's no way on the front panel to go, can I just bring this in and maybe load into one of the splits something to vote? To process my voice so i can have you know my favorite vocal sound right. on one layer and my synth I, there's well, no there was no obvious route to that in this uh, as it stands i'm pretty sure that will happen but it didn't it, seem to be there the, when i did it the, you know the you know their effects have got really good in recent years so yeah I mean, yeah, yeah. Be, that's true to be able to do that i thought that might be quite cool okay uh yeah okay well i think generally quite interesting and also i was thinking about uh you know we've seen it now with standalone ableton and machine as well that clearly that these embedded systems are powerful enough to run things um you know in the past we had to rely either on taking your laptop out and a controller keyboard which we know all the perils involved in that but also you know uh what was the thing called the big computer in a in a case uh oh, no, the, oh ne know, the uh, open labs thing yeah yeah the and then labs? And, yeah originally and that's way back in it like 20 years ago but then also there was that um rack unit that was knocking around um sort of 15 yes years the ago, uh oh <laughs> gosh yes i can't remember uh, what richard now. nickel might remember my, my, <laughs> yeah, i know what yeah. it is uh synth anatomy in the chat hi there mate uh the input is designed for the code of v yes apparently so um i didn't get around to that i'm afraid i know richard sorry we've been uh we've been we've been banging on about it we did a talk about this a little bit pre-show um i know it's not analog but i mean there's a lot of analog modeling but it's an interesting concept i mean do you play live is this sort of thing that would be useful to you i mean i'm sure you can appreciate the work that goes into a product this complex and this new no, I, I totally get it. And I think the fact that you could have a Buchla music easel and a Moog modular system pre-patched in a box for your show is fantastic. If you are a user of the V collection this thing, and you play live, this thing is sort of a no-brainer. Um, I'm a big proponent of, you know, analog or digital really is not terribly important to me, but what is important, you know, get the laptop off the stage and play an, play an instrument. It, it solves a lot of problems from a technical issue, but it also I feel like it connects you to the audience a lot more than hiding behind that screen. So uh, this, I think, does an amazing job of bringing the artist to the forefront and allows them to use an amazing collection of sounds. Uh, there's, there's some quirky things about this, certainly, but I think what Arturi is, and this is just me guessing here, I feel like there's, this is the beginning of a platform for them uh, where they are, you know, they're going to take feedback from a very vocal group of users that tour with this thing, and they're going to make changes, and they're going to adjust it, and you know, I would love to see a platform that works in maybe the same way. If you remember the uh, the Nord modular and the Nord modular G2, where you could plug it in to your computer and edit the sounds and everything, the DSP and everything would run on the synth, but you would basically have a system that you could edit in real time. Now, imagine doing that like Nord modular sounded good but imagine being able to do that with a full moog modular system or a bukla like that's there's a lot of really really interesting potential there and i think this is early days for this platform mm. and 
I'm, I'm kind of excited about it because it does open, it, it makes this digital world feel more analog, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I do know what, exactly what you mean. What's interesting is there's a host USB port, and this is something I explored. It was very easy to plug like a, a Keystep 37 into it and have the splits or the layer controlled by different key beds. What I couldn't figure out, and this is, you know, if I plugged a box of knobs, which I did, you know, 16, I, I can't remember what it was. It was a, 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 a novation thing. I don't know how on earth I would assign any of that stuff. But you could imagine when you're running something like a, a complex modular patch, the points at which you could introduce MIDI control, if that was sort of easy to set up and made sense, then yeah, that would that that, that totally works. I'm sure there's more to talk about with this, but I'm just going to have to interrupt so we can quickly have a a, a, um, a message from our friends over at Native Instruments. Yeah, Guitar Egg Pro Seven, in fact, your new inspiration suite filled with new amps, effects, and pedals could spark your creativity and shape your sound. Guitar Rig 7 is also available as part of Music Production Suite 6. Of course, it doesn't have to just be used on guitars. It can be used on synthesizers and voices and all kinds of stuff. So you could save 10% with the code SONIC10 at checkout at nativeinstruments.com and check out the Crosstalk Piano as well, because that's one of their new plugins. Also, you can use the same checkout code SONIC10. We thank them very much for their sponsorship. Okay. Oh, right. The Muse the Muse Receptor. That was the That thing. was it. We yeah. used Brian Lancer. That's him. We always used to do stuff with the Muse Receptor. And it was yeah. again again that was so ahead of its time. It was a Linux wrapper for or it might have been a Windows wrapper. Maybe it was Linux. And it was a yeah, it was a Muse and that, yeah, that so nearly it so nearly went and there were people yeah, that's right. Linux Receptor nicely. Did you get that from your brain or from the chat room? You could no, be or image, Google. Google image search. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, very honest of you there. I appreciate that. Yeah, so good. Well, I mean, we wish them the best of luck. And I think the thing is, is that a part of the issue with any platform like this is the full potential is very hard to realise at launch. But the problem is you sort of need the imagination or you need the full potential or most of it to be there at launch so that people go, yeah, I must have that. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a tricky one, but fair play to them. I mean, it's, you know, can, it's can an I ask one considerable question? amount of investment. Yeah, sure. Is it, is it just the 61 key available so far? At present? Yeah, definitely. I don't know if they're going anywhere else. I'd imagine they're going to see how it goes before they start pressing the button on different hardware forms and um, mm -hmm. see whether it actually, you know, I would think, yeah. Uh, if anybody else has got any questions, I mean, I have had one here for a little while, so I can maybe answer them. Ah, Steve's question, there with a question. Nick. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I noticed just looking around at it yesterday that the, uh, is it the case that the presets, or at least some of the presets are grouped together by artist name? There's uh, like you a, can a whole set. Yeah, you, yeah, you can browse yeah. by instrument, by sound bank, by type. I think by sound creator, so it's it's who who's made them. So yeah, they they're sort of trying to replicate the browser experience that you have yeah. in Analog Lab. I Actually, think. what I saw was that you could scroll through on that rather fabulous looking sort of um, round selector thermostat. And, yes, yeah, that's it. Um, and I noticed that you could um, choose a whole bunch of, for example, Boards of Canada sounds or uh, Gary Newman sounds, would you believe? And there was Radiohead artist. there as well. Maybe. Yeah, I'd artist. have to double check that. You might be, uh, uh, it might be, that might be the case. I mean, it's just a simple matter of tagging, I think, and where you put, yeah. when you're putting the patch together, it's all to do with the meta tagging, as with these things often are. You know, when you're browsing, yeah. it's like, woohoo, but when you're creating patches, you have to remember to enter all that stuff in, otherwise it's, it's yeah. just... Well, it, it did just strike me... One. <laughs> <laughs> it did just um it did just strike me once again that this is an instrument that's aimed at players more than sound designers i i think it, it would seem and that would yeah. be a, a clear way of enticing people you know in music shops and at the at the at festivals and 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 that kind of thing you look at a, a a keyboard and it says oh wow with this sound you can sound like boards of canada which of course is all of our dreams right so um yeah you know it, it sounds like a sort of canny approach i suppose 
Yeah, Div Kid in the chat room. Hey, Ben, nice to see you. Uh, says Marla Melodies has been posting about issues on his social pages because he had was sent one and I think he chose not to review it. Because, I, and this was a, something I wrestled with initially, was it didn't feel like it was quite finished, the integration. I got some firmware literally yesterday morning that kind of made it a bit of a smoother integration. So I just thought, right, I'll do it and I'll try not to be too negative about it, which I don't think I was. I just tried to be honest about it. And I think uh, Mylar just sort of felt it wasn't quite ready for prime time. And he probably had to make his decision earlier than I did. So fair point. But check it out on his socials. Uh, nice to see you, Ben. Um, OK, well, let's get on to another topic, shall we? Uh, gosh, there's there's many. Should we go for Club Life documentary? Should we just get right into a bit of proper nostalgia? I think we probably should. I'm going to get busted for this. So this is uh, Club Life, not documentaries, BBC uh, 1998, I believe it was, and it was to do with Mix Mag uh, um, Awards for best single, best, Club Life 98, the best, oh, of best a rollicking live in dance music act, and best DJ, best this, that and the other, the and it just, it's so... scruffy, smiley face of 88 to the chic urban glamour of 98. Yeah, it's a kind of lifestyle thing. And it, what got me about this was the, and it's, very, it's a great uh, thing. It was a post found by, I think, Midiera. So you can check it out on the site, the, the actual link to the, uh, I think the, the link went into the show notes. Not only was it a, a great trip, I mean, because I, I imagine many of the panel, that was the era when we were going to those sort of things. We were going out clubbing perhaps more often than we do now, if at all. And we were engaging in that. And it just made me think, goodness, that what a vibrant scene it was then. What an enormous amount of people there were out there making music, performing music. I mean, you know, yes, there was quite a lot of machinery and maybe playback and dat tapes and stuff involved. But the scene around it was huge. And we seem to have completely, that seems to have just gone. That You know, it's a totally different um landscape i mean i know we've gone through a, a global pandemic which made it hard for people to go out and there's beginning to again i wonder what you thought about this guys because i mean i know we, i went to your, along to your rack records launch and there were people in a room and it was all great i but I, I must admit i mean not because of you or the subject I, I thought i'm in a big closed room with a load of people i had covid when i got back from now i hope i don't get it again and i and that wasn't a, a reflection on that particular space it's just in the back of my mind, you know, I need retraining not to feel like an old folk who needs to worry about where the parking space is and the loos are, you know, I'm kind of like, we're suffering from that a bit, I think. I think raving and illegal raving is back. I mean, there's been a lot of parties going on around here uh, a lot. Um, like last weekend, there was one that was on all weekend. I could hear it bumping away. Um, and I think it needs that sort of, for me anyway, I liked, I was part of the early 90s underground sort of dance music scene. I didn't like it when it all got cleaned up after the criminal justice bill, which came in in 94, which right. uh, moved things away from the free party scene and into clubs and into, you know, and into the hands of the gangsters and that kind of thing. And I just didn't like it. I just did not like that shift. Um, I would recommend, highly recommend a film that came out. I went to see it in the cinema. It's on very limited showing but called free party um a folk history um about the british sort of uh sort of you know free party scene spanning from about 1988 through to about 1991 oh actually no right up until the um, the criminal justice bill but i mean i think the peak era um and there was such a vibrant uh, culture that, that came that popped up around that and i was fortunate enough to be part of that and i think uh there was something just really beautiful and sort of utopian about it and the newness of the music kind of fitted with that i mean we've just mm. been emerging from the 1980s and certainly in wales there's a lot of depressed people following all the closures of the collieries and various other sort of social yeah, absolutely change that was going on that the kind of rave scene um and you know was amazing but i think i mean again uh this idea that club the clubs once they became uh i don't know some i think the music I, the the music changed, I think, as well, and, and not necessarily for the better. I think it sort of became a little bit more, um, uh, 
uh, standardized or well, it's or, pop. Or, okay, pop, pop. It's popular. Pop I music suppose. tends to kind of you know popularity starts underground and then ends up being popular. You only got to look at what's happened to most most in urban uh, you know, interesting urban areas, which was a lot of vibe, and now there's a lot of. Um, mums and dads and, and primary schools. I mean, that's just the way that society, because <laughs> the money moves in, people go, I want to live there. But it's an interesting thing. I mean, I, I have to come to you, of course, as well, Steve, because, I mean, you, like uh, like I, probably were in our pomp at that time. You know, I was making music. I was sort of doing remixes. Yeah. And th that's another part of it. There was so much movement in music technology and investment into it because it was seen as such a big growth. And we just seem... I mean, while we've got it now, it doesn't have the same... I mean, I'm, I'm not, I hope I'm not sounding like an old gate who's going, no, like it used to be, but it doesn't have the same energy, I suppose. Or maybe I don't have the same energy. I don't know. Um, well, just on the energy thing, uh, I was really, I, I went on a real a trip down memory lane watching this thing, uh, this program, because it started off with the Big Beat Boutique, which was yes. a very famous nightclub down here in Brighton that was run by Skint Records, uh, most famously by, famously by Norman Cook, who we all know now as Fatboy Slim. And I was a regular there towards the end of its life, actually, because I, I arrived in Brighton maybe a little bit late. But I remember um, the, the, the thing that I was reminded of by watching this was just how much fun it was. It was there was a real um, every time you went to the Big Beat Boutique, especially in its first venue, which was a very small place down here. You, it felt like you were walking into a youth club for adults, and you know you look at this um, uh, program and you can see there are smiling faces and there's a sense of excitement. And it this isn't all. In fact, it didn't look to me like it, this was really about chemical enhancements. This was actually a whole bunch of young people kind of really excited to be um, at this uh, classic club at, at, at a time that was a, a real peak uh, for music down here in, in Brighton. And, and I could talk about that all day. But in terms of the music, what I think was particularly interesting about this time was that this was the sort of, as, as I look at it, it was kind of like the second phase of um, what we used to call alternative or indie dance, which was really a time when uh, guitar bands that had been playing sort of, you know, variations of 60s or 70s rock in the 80s had embraced beats and hip hop and that kind of thing and started making records that were suitable for the dance floor. So you could think of the first wave as all the Manchester stuff, which was interesting enough. But this uh, uh, era that they focused on in the program was what I consider to be the second wave when you had the, the really big people who knew exactly what they were doing, like the Prodigy, like the Chemical Brothers, like uh, Norma Cook, Fatboy Slim, all taking big chunks of old records and whizzing them up for the, the dance floor and creating just a, to go back to where we started here, a, a whole load of energy, which... Um, I, I, I know that we still have around today, but I think that the, the big difference between then and now is uh, the enforcement of copyright. Do you know what I mean? Because back Maybe in those so, days, yeah. you could put out a, a white label, um, which is a, a sort of like a promo or a test pressing on vinyl, and you could send it out to a whole load of DJs, and half of that uh, white label could just be a big slab of a, I don't know, disco record from the 70s, which Darth Punk did quite a lot. Um, and it wouldn't matter because it would still have your stamp on the white label. It would, If it went down well on the dance floor, that was job done. But then the lawyers moved in towards the end of the 90s. And now, of course, as we all know, you can get a copyright strike on places like SoundCloud and YouTube. So that uh, ability to take the the sounds of the past and just stick them into a new context. That's kind of gone, which I think is a bit of a shame. Uh, but I think that was one of the keys of the vibrancy of, of some of the scene that you saw there. And certainly a big part of what we used to call Big Beat, which was the sort of party version of hip hop breaks. Well, it's interesting you say that, but then, I, 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 my lad, I would pe I, I would put forward the case of Beyonce and covering uh, Dolly Parton and uh, doing some country stuff, which is essentially the similar sort of thing. But obviously, she's got a re agreements with those people, the original songwriters, yeah. so it's a lot easier to do. But uh, interesting. I don't know, Richard. I don't know what the nineties 
of that period were like in America, whether there was a similar movement or whether, because I my recollection of that period in America was it was all about what I call Pro Tools rock. So all of these kind of rock bands that used Pro Tools basically, and all their records were toothpaste, and they all used Apogee Rosettas, and it all sounded very much the same. But it was a thing, you know. I mean, it was a thing. No, I, the the rave scene in America was huge, and uh, I I spent my college years. Uh, every weekend going to different raves. It was different here. It wasn't in clubs. Um, it would just be outdoor parties that uh, someone would find a field somewhere in a farm or uh, an old abandoned uh, drive-in movie theater or something, and uh, they would just put up some giant speakers and invite you know, 5,000 of their closest friends. And we would drive to one of those every weekend. And it was fantastic. Uh, I was really into trance at the time. Uh, jungle was big as well, but it was it was these all night parties where you would just go and dance from the moment you got there until you know twelve hours later when you dragged yourself home. It was fantastic. Uh, not to mention the ridiculous pants everybody wore and the crazy outfits. Uh, <laughs> but you're right about the energy. There was just so much energy to it. Uh, and here, certainly the, the the events I went to, there would be light shows or laser shows, but it wasn't crazy like it is now. Uh, it was it was more uh, these people were putting on their first show or second show. So it was a uh, smaller budget, but the music was loud and it sounded good. And that's really all that mattered. But it was it was a big part of my uh, college years. Mm. Well, I wonder, I mean, because, I mean, now legislation in many places has, has made this sort of thing kind of practically illegal pretty much everywhere. You're not allowed to gather, you're not allowed, you know, that all of these laws have meant that people of a certain age can't get together and have a good time without paying the requisite amount of tax or policing fees or parking or whatever. Yeah, sorry, Steve. I can see you have a... Um, yeah, Nick, I'm, I'm glad you moved the conversation on to that because that was something I, I kind of wanted to mention. Um I think, um, and I'm not the first person to, to say this or think this, but I think that really um, vibrant musical and cultural scenes require signature venues. They require like focal points, you know, like um, if we consider back in the 80s and 90s, there was a, a venue in Manchester called the Hacienda. And um, it's it's legendary now. Um, if any of if any of you ever been there, its atmosphere made up for its shortcoming comings as a nightclub. But it, it was very, very famous, and it brought people to Manchester, and it and it the music scene in Manchester thrived around it and other places as well. We had a similar place in Newcastle when I lived there called the Riverside, um, and that was the focal point for the musical culture of the area. Now, one of the things that made both of those venue work and so important was because they were in both in city centers they were open pretty much four or five nights a week doing something or other and they weren't expensive mm. and that was the crucial thing because it enabled you know you know back in the day 14 and 15 year olds to turn up on a saturday night and actually afford to get in and drink and then and then you know if you compare that to, to, to today um, because of the change of laws and the sort of financial structure of uh, property and music scenes in city centers it's hugely expensive and it excludes a lot of uh, younger people from participating for example um, I was talking to some of my students a few weeks ago about how often they go to gigs and uh, they just said, well, we rarely do it. And these are music students, by the way. And they said that we really d rarely do it. First of all, um, half of us can't get in because we don't have the right kind of ID. And we're talking about 20 year olds here, by the way, not, not teenagers. We don't have the right kind of ID, so we don't get in. But when we do get in, we're being charged eight pounds for a can of warm cider. Um, so the actual event when they get Experience, in yeah. is expensive and, and not particularly good. My point is that these uh, this new generation of musicians stays disparate, and they don't coalesce uh, and create that's, that's very true. energy and excitement and vibrancy like we've like we could see at the big boot 
boutique. I don't know what the solution is, is here. I, I really don't. But I, I think that we need to take some of the lessons that we all learned in the 20th century to a 21st century context. And uh, otherwise, I think we're, gonna, we're seriously going to be missing out. That's really interesting. I mean, I would like to point out, you know, that's one of the reasons that I like doing the Sonic Live events is because I feel like I'm contributing some of that. But it's get it's hard, man. It's really hard. The venue costs a lot of money to run. And it, we have to do it on a Friday or a Saturday night because Bath is a small place and you can't get footfall any other time. And, it, you know, I would love to make it easier and we're working on what we can. But I mean, it's, you know, it's while it's good and to do the energy, it's not also good to go and lose, you know, five, 600 quid just to put on an event that's fun. You know, I, I need to be able to break even. And those, and the, right, the structure isn't there. It's just too, it's too hard. You know, it really is hard. I, I got to pause there a minute because we do have a message from our friends. I mean, the bills need to be paid, right? And uh, this is one of the reasons. Uh, so I want to say thank you to Isotope for uh, sponsoring the show. Reintroducing yeah, Isotope Trash reissue. Trash your favorite creative distortion plugin from Isotope. Break, distort, and mangle your tracks with an endless assortment of chaotic combinations. Transform your sound in ways you never imagined. Take your tracks to new distorted dimensions with the trash module. Twist things even further and send your audio into another space with the Convolve module. Add energy and depth to your sound with the new Envelope Follower. Say goodbye to writer's block and distort without limits. Isotope Trash. Distortion redefined. And once again, we thank them very much for their support of the show. It's what help keeps the whole thing going. And nice to see lots of support in the chat from uh, our friends sort of suggesting that they would happily pay a, a decent uh, fee to get in. And that's all true. I mean, I think that's great. And uh, I'm very much appreciated. But I think ultimately, you know, the, the environment, in it, like you say, in the inner cities, it's just not really there. Um, we could go on about this for ages, and I, I suppose I knew that was going to happen. But I think we should probably talk a little bit about uh, another uh, another instrument. This is actually kind of an interesting one. So uh, let's just have one more topic, if you've all got time. Mm. This is the new uh, Iodio I I I Loom, which is another MPE surface. It's got loads of really interesting positional data on it. And it's on Kickstarter at the moment. I'm just trying to think if I've... Uh, I'm going to try and find that because I think... I think it doesn't load the page very easily. So I'm just going to throw that. There's 24 hours to go. It's reached 120 grand. So that's gone up by nearly nine grand since yesterday when I sent the post. It's so interesting, isn't it? We... We're craving, we want, we so desperately want these new forms of expression in our lives, which I think in a way is kind of bizarrely linked to our previous topic. And we think by buying these, and and, and, and I know Adeo do some great stuff, and it's, this is what, I just found this really fascinating. 410 backers, 24 hours to go, and this thing, it looks, it's just about the demonstration, isn't it? It's a great, it looks like a really interesting thing. I don't know, um, Richard, you... I don't know whether you've, you know, there's a whole new breed of them. It's, it, inevitably, they all seem to be by French people. As I've said before, <laughs> all of these great controllers are by French people. Is it just because of the way they gesticulate when they talk and that they're just more predisposed to making gestural control? I don't know. But this looks really interesting, doesn't it? I love this controller. I, I think uh, it's... It, you can play it in a way that feels natural. So the whole idea of alternative controllers, to me, is finding a way to take what you do naturally and use that to create art. And I think this does such a nice job of taking how you sort of naturally want to press and move your fingers to create sounds and it translates it really nicely into uh, control messages for an instrument. And that, I think it does it really well. I love that you, you there's enough of a guide there to show you where the notes should be, but it's very free form. So it's almost like a fretless bass 
so to speak. But then on the on the side, there's different touch parameters, and there's you can strum it. Uh, we we talked about that other uh, that other uh, controller a few weeks ago that was uh, basically a big piece of. Uh, like PVC or something. This one really feels, uh, it adds an organicness. Maybe it's just the piece of wood that they use there, but it, it really does mm. feel like you're interacting with something. Uh, and and I, I would love one of these things. I, I dig it quite a bit. Yeah, I, I, I'm desperately trying to load the page, but it won't let me verify I'm a human. I keep saying, well, I suppose this is the computer that's trying to, and it just won't let me in. I, I don't know. They, they, they've set their, their level to. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to see desperately. Oh, yeah, uh, September 2024. I think there might be some left. Uh, 35, two octaves, 259 euros, three octaves, 369. And that's that's quite a lot of uh, um, of discount there. So I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, Gaz, you were using the Touche performing live, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, which I, I was terribly worried because you're pressing down quite hard and it was all on a little shelf and I just had this image of the whole thing flipping up. Uh, I'm glad it's, it didn't happen. It will happen, though, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, this looks great. Uh, I mean, obviously comparison to the Harkin Continuum is probably the Mini, yeah, the Mini of, sort of thing, isn't it? Mini, but without the sound although, engine, right. Although the, the Harkin, of course, has that, you know, fabric that you can really press in. I'm assuming this is a hard surface. Um, is it? Or, um, I'm yes. not sure what, the, what this is, a hard surface, but it does respond to pressure. Um, yeah, I'm I mean... Let's see if I can... Yeah, that would be interesting. I haven't looked at it too deeply, this, but I mean, at the moment, that that price is very tempting, isn't it? And it's it's kind of interesting to offer it in a two octave or a three octave version. I think the three octaves is the interesting bit for me because two octaves, you, there's that thing. Unless you're playing in the right key, you know, you, you just you don't get the full two octaves. So having a three oct well, unless you're transposing, but I think three octaves is a really is really appealing. Um, like a really expressive voice, I think needs certainly two and a half octaves. So, mm. um, uh, so I, I'm 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 like this about I'm I'm very tempted to to take a punt on this uh i'd love to have seen cv controls yeah, uh, yeah it doesn't look like there's cv going out uh, no, but there's that really uh, interesting strum thing which looks really good so you yeah. can kind of strum as well there's all these i wish i could show you this but um the kickstarter is being really draconian about not letting me uh open so the, it up. The, sorry about that. i mean the array array um uh, what's it called it's the array, array touch array? yeah the, it's like the uh the bit yeah yeah, I, think I mean that the, the touch two. Yeah, that looks amazing. Good. The touch two, and especially being a second generation, as well. But also just the fact that that version two has got all those CV and gate uh, outputs. Things I wouldn't yeah. have been bothered about five years ago, but now it's <laughs> now it's essential. essential. Yeah, because I guess with this yeah. you're going to need you get you would need something like uh, you know you need something that would interface USB and inter I guess an expert it's sleepers or something. It I don't know got, what. what it has got analog. It has got a MIDI DIN or or three. I don't know what. Right. It's probably three and a three and a half millimeter MIDI. Um, so I'm just looking. Uh, so it is. It is. It, I think this looks nice and compact, though. The Airi looks. You're gonna have to dedicate a, a decent amount of um, desktop space yeah. for it. Whereas this, this has got is, loads of different modes as well. You've got string modes, you've got drum kit mode, you've got fader yeah. mode, you've got, you've got grid like mode. Draw, draw bar sort of mode or like spectral Yeah, there's mode. loads. I wish I could show you, but you know, like I say, it's just I'm not allowed. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I don't think they're struggling for backers, so I think we're all right. It, I don't did think you say it's two six nine or something in you. I'm just trying to see what the current. Uh, uh, so let's have a look. look. What is there left? I don't know what they've got left. Actually, to be honest, uh -huh. I don't know what there is, it's really hard oh. to see because the, there's yeah. this website seems completely. Uh, yeah, I two don't know. Five, it says it's got two five nine for the two octave one or three six nine. Not cheap, but that yeah. So I mean oh. that's. That's, and that's thirty five percent off, so it's going to be about four hundred. It's going to be four or five hundred euros okay. when you when you're getting that. And if, I know, Steve, is this a is this a sort of? I mean, you know, there's keyboards all over your your crib. There, are you uh, are you <laughs> craving a, a, a new way of expressing yourself? Um, 
Musically? No. I should add. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I mean, I, I do wish these guys well, and I don't want to uh, pass judgment on this. I think it's definitely something that if you hold in your hand and slide around, uh, I do, uh, it, you, you can get a feel for it. I quite like the Formica looking sort of uh, middle bit, which, which appeals to me. Thing is, though, um, I think that for me, there's just a bit of a problem with these controllers in general. Like, you know, we had one on the show a couple of weeks ago, and I think I was I was the guy who was um, against Kitars, uh, which didn't ah. seem to be a popular opinion, but there we are. But, um, but I just sort of feel, for me, I've got to put in so much time to learn how to use these uh, instruments properly. And then the skill that I've developed to play this isn't transferable. It's not transferable, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, uh, I've got about, I don't know, the best part of, well, more than 40 years of playing keyboards. I kind of know what I'm doing now. And so if I can play the uh, the OB6 down there, I can probably play the subsequent 37 over there. You know what I mean? My hands will move in the same way. And it's a similar thing with guitar. But I find that with these new instruments, for me, it's like... I've got the choice of playing any brass instrument and I've chosen the trombone, which if you to understand the, the metaphor I'm making yes. here, it's the, the trombone. It's got no valves. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All, everyone else is a valve. That, actually, that metaphor sounded much better in my head, by the way. No, um, I, I, I so completely just, get that. There are uh, none left. You might have, you, there are none sorry? left. There are none left, by the way. Oh, okay. Oh, like wow. Okay. Well, that's great. So they've sold <laughs> out. Um, Sorry, I would just, like to point out uh, that uh, the, the show one. title has just been has just been set by you, Steve. I think I'm going to call it. It's a non-transferable skill, because so I think that will uh, <sighs> that will probably it, it kind of applies to so many things in our world. <laughs> yeah. in our little niche. <laughs> At the same time, I mean, you know what? Stuff, it, uh, oh no! Sorry. In the end, um, th there will be. Somebody there are some left. There are some left. Sorry, there are some left. Sorry, some left. Sorry, there are some left. Okay, um, you know somebody out there is going to pick up this uh, machine, and they're going to make something that none of us have heard before, and it's going to blow us away, and uh, and we're all going to want one. That's the that's the magic of this world, isn't it? You know, we're all creatives. We'll work it out. Um, I suppose, really, I just I got to fifty. And uh, a, few, a couple of years ago, and I promised myself I wasn't going to learn anything new. I've given myself the rest of my life off. So maybe I, you know, <laughs> I'll step back on this. I think there's something uh, to be said. Says, I look like I get sitar elbow within days. I just want to interject there. Uh, but yes, go for it, uh, Richard. I, I think there's, uh, I, I do a lot of thinking about uh, alternative controllers and different ways of interacting with instruments. And I, I think there's, uh, because the goal is to find, you know, a way that feels very natural and uh, works with the instrument that uh, you're playing. But what you what you often find is if you take a piano style keyboard that that's very it's really good at playing uh, chromatic uh, sort of scaled music it does that exceptionally well you get a lot of feel you get a lot of expression out of a keyboard uh, but what you what you don't get is the ability to uh, sort of customize the scales and customize that aspect of it so if you say that okay that's fine well what are the alternatives then you look at something like a, a capacitive touchpad or something like uh, this and you say well this is great because you can then you can customize what the notes are and you can customize um, what the interaction you have with it. But there's a compromise, and that compromise is that you lose, like Steve was saying, you lose all that muscle memory that you've gained from playing uh, mm -hmm. a piano-style keyboard. Now, so what you have to ask yourself then is, well, is the advantage of having the customization, is that worth giving up that skill set and uh do, in what, certain are you times giving, why are you is. giving it up though why are you giving it up because you can you know you can drive a car and ride a bike i mean you don't, the two aren't mutually exclusive well I, of course you could have them side by side but i'm, I'm saying if if you're going to interact with uh, if you plug it into an instrument and you say i'm going to play this instrument using this um 
you you you're not going to have that and a piano next to it and, and sort of play both. You're going to pick one or the other, and I think that's where a lot of these alternative controllers sort of sort of fall is it's you know say I'll j- I can already play it with a piano. What else am I getting out of this? Uh, I do you know what I would actually kind of question that i think given the slimness of this i could imagine that going either in front or be or behind a keyboard you can have both. Actually, i'm sure you could do both and i think can. the combination of both would be really good i think um you know i, I i'm that's what that's how i was imagining mm. using it really almost like if you put it down at the front you could almost use it just as like a really super clever um, you know, the, the ribbon in, on a CS80 or something, but you can have it do loads well, yeah, of Yeah, hydrosynth. Things. Yeah. 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 So you can have one, you I, play one context, side of a hydrosynth right. deluxe with one and then, and then with it. The, or, uh, I mean, if uh, not that the Astrolab, as far as I can tell, responds to MPE, but you could use it with the Astrolab, for instance, plug it into the host port and have all of that mm. stuff, assuming it was easy to map or whatever. That's interesting. Yeah, I suppose yeah. that's... Yeah. I, I think in that context, you guys are right. Uh, the idea that this is a, a secondary controller for something like that really does then give you the best of both worlds. Uh, it's just is the the software then would be flexible enough to use it as a modulation source or to use it as a, sort of a mod wheel type of thing, like the Expressive E, for example. Yeah, uh, this would be great. And the fact that it can do the guitar strumming, I think, is interesting. And you could play it if you wanted to, uh, like a fretless guitar. I, Yeah, and that, okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair enough. Okay, that's, uh, I don't know where the scoreboard is, but we'll be bringing it up at some point in the, uh, by the end of the, the, the of 2025, there will be a leaderboard of uh, conceded points and points, points for and against somewhere, maybe, yeah. or probably not. Um, Sorry, yeah, so, interesting. Yeah. So there are some left. There, there are some left. Um, I, I was just having a look then. Um, there are a uh, hundred, there's something like a hundred, um, yeah, hundred left. Or oh, I've lost no, it. I've lost it now. Oh. Yeah, so uh, there are some left. Terrible, terrible website. 153, 153 left, and of the two octave, and uh, how many? That's plenty there. Well, imagine. So, I mean, yeah. selling out your first run is an always. I mean, that's where you want to be, isn't it? You've got. I've had this idea. We've made a prototype. I've sold out. I mean, I know Richard. Have you ever done any Kickstarter stuff with, uh, you know, with anything? I mean, because I, I'm lots of synth manufacturers give it a go. I mean, it must be great knowing that you've sold everything and therefore you've got cash flow and all of that stuff. A great, a great feeling, I'd imagine. We did. The original uh, Voltage Research Laboratory was a Kickstarter. We launched it in 2019, and uh, we reached our goal. It was like six hours or something. Uh, wow. It was fantastic. And it is it is very reassuring knowing that you're going to you right. you make these. They've <laughs> already either sold or you, have, you're, you, know, you are going to sell them. So that's very reassuring. However, Kickstarter uh, does have, you know, it's not the perfect platform because people are, because they're prepaying, um, people are expecting very you. large discounts. And Kickstarter takes 15% of all that money. That's so uh, yeah. you, you typically end up with uh, less than you expect to. Mm. I suppose the thing is also, you know, it's a bit like, I mean, if I was, if you were doing pre-orders or a manufacturer's doing a pre-order, there was that legendary thing, isn't it, where the guy who's who was building remakes of the VCS3 had something like a 15-year waiting list. This way, you're just, you're, you're kind of formalizing the waiting list and everybody's happy to pay up front and they're not going to get annoyed about it because you're telling them what the terms are and what you're likely to make. So I suppose in a way it sort of formalizes that. And you're also thinking about your capacity when you have to make them as well. Because, I mean, I know some Kickstarters go terribly wrong where people just sort of go, oh, yeah, uh, this, that, and the other, and then suddenly they can't make it or they've they come up, up against a, a manufacturer problem that's meant that they've you know they've got issues i mean we've seen it time and time again but it's it's a t- i mean it's a tough business making stuff so i guess we've got to give 15 percent away as well anyway i thought i'd throw that in there um look i, I think we're probably going to have to knock things on the head because uh we're getting along to that time i've got to uh, got to get on the road and do things but it's been lovely to have you richard um i'm guessing you're well you say we're gonna be 
seeing you at Superbooth. I, I must send you our ad packages. I've forgotten I hadn't, so I will do that. I might even give you a discount as a loyal as a loyal member of the uh, Sonic Talk. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, we will definitely see you there, and um, that's going to be great. Yeah. I hope you got because we talk about your logistics. I hope you get that sorted out because it's a it is a nightmare moving stuff across borders. <laughs> Everything is coming from These Germany this year. We're not going to lose anything in. Uh, on the, they're not going to lose our luggage again. I'm convinced this is our year. I'm feeling it. <laughs> feeling it. So you're not going to be walking around the uh, the site with an ill-fitting pair of uh, girl shorts and a crop top t-shirt thinking, I wish I'd had time to go and buy some more luggage that replaced all my outfits. Why I may I still wear the crop top and the ill-fitting shorts, but that'll be my decision. <laughs> That's a person. And not choice. forced on me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Uh, it reminds me of a story. I'm, I'll quickly tell you this. It reminds me of a story. I used to share a house with uh, a chap who was, he was like a six foot 11 Homer Simpson. If you could just take that kind of image and, and, and hold it in your mind. He started a job uh, working for a big multinational electronics company. And his first uh, thing was they, they all went to the Seychelles or something for a big conference and they all got together. Uh, bearing in mind, he's six foot 11 and massive. So he goes there. He's, He's supposed to meet the CEO and all of his team and his line managers and all this stuff. And they lost his luggage. <laughs> so he gets to, to this tiny little Pacific Island or wherever it was, where clearly they don't have shops for outsized people and spent the entire rest of the time meeting all of his future bosses and, and co-workers dressed in basically a pair of tiny shorts and ill-fitting T-shirts <laughs> for the whole time. <laughs> Imagine that. What a nightmare. Anyway, I'll leave you with that, Steve. Lovely to have you as well. Um, I hope... Uh, you, we haven't uh, interrupted your day too much. You go, are you coming to Berlin? Are you thinking about going to? Uh, no, I'm, no, I'm afraid not. I'm I'm off to uh, Turkey, Istanbul next uh, week, uh, which uh, is a sort of which I'm luckily turning uh, into a combination of a holiday and a bit of work as well, which um, which should be really nice. I'm afraid uh, Germany will have to wait. Well, it's not until May. Um, you got the middle of May, sixteenth of oh. May, so you've got plenty of time. <laughs> oh, well, maybe. So, maybe. All right. <laughs> wow, well, I'm so glad I managed to turn that round. Excellent. That, Thanks, uh, Nick. When the scoreboard comes up, that'll be another one in my column, I think. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah. Uh, Gaz, lovely to see you too. Uh, uh, how's the live streaming schedule going? Are you still doing that, or are you kind <laughs> of a bit going, too busy? It's going. Um, I'm going to do it tonight. Because I want, I've, oh, fantastic. Been, I've been furiously editing the gig um, from last week, the Rack Records launch. Um, and actually, maybe I can ask a question here, because obviously uh, it's quite a long concert. Uh, the concert comprised of two one hour performances. Um, so I'm trying to decide. I was thinking of doing like one of the performances tonight and then the, the other tomorrow at the same time. Or should I just run both of them back to back? and do I, and set them for sort of pr premiere in yeah in i own. would i would maybe do clips tonight promote the next stream for and make that as a premiere so people can put it up online so then people can wait and you can all hang out and watch it together and then you can be in the chat so if you do it as a premiere at, at, at a future date and promote that tonight that's what <sighs> i would say I, that's like what a clever organized person would do do you know what i'm i'm not i'm going to do the both tonight i've just decided at the same time because <laughs> yeah well no uh sequentially but what i'm going to do is i'm going to start at half past eight and i'm going to do a little talk uh for mm. half an hour <laughs> a little talk <laughs> and then i'm going to go live at half past eight with the first performance and the next one I'm going to schedule for 10 o'clock because that's exactly the times that they took place at exactly uh, half past yes, eight fair enough. and 10 o'clock in last week. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll look forward to that. But thank you, everybody. Thanks to everybody in the chats and the YouTubes and thanks to Wagyu. Sorry, I didn't get the IRC page up. I don't know why I did, but I would like to point out, finally, uh, there's the Kickstarter. It did decide to arrive, but too late. You blew it. I mean, I don't know. You know <laughs> that page response time is completely unacceptable. I'm a busy guy. <laughs> right, folks, uh, lovely to see you all. Uh, we thanks. will see you uh, next time. And thanks to everybody in the chats. Lovely to see you all. Don't forget, uh, if you've got questions, Questions about the Astrolab? Head over to Kickstart uh, to Patreon. It's a it's a public post, so you can leave comments on there, and I'll make a video uh, for our Patreon users. But you might have questions that need answering. Thanks, it. That's it. See you next time. Take care. Bye bye now. See you. Everybody.